how to tell. So, well, um, Lenny, you declined to announce us. Our slot was labeled Yoshida Roberts, and um, it seemed clear that the organizers were hinting that, that we should uh, talk about a specific work. Um, that hit which became a strong implication when Adam told me that we should talk about a specific work, um, Chaos and Complexity by Design. Um, and so since I'm notoriously known for my ability to follow rules, I'll be giving the uh, Yoshida portion of the, of the talk, which was labeled first, on, on our o paper, and then halfway through, I guess, we'll switch to the Robert portion, where Benny will tell you about something new. Um, so, um, the question uh, we're interested in is understanding, uh, I also thought this would be a bit later, after maybe some more of the uh, physics concepts were developed, um, but um, maybe we can experience it, uh, you can, in hindsight, understand the things I'm going to tell you. So, um, well, what I'm going to be talking about is the relationship between sort of the complexity issues in holography and randomness, and in particular, fine-grained notions of randomness. Um, so, in particular, um, we're, we're interested in how we represent the interior of a large ADS black hole in the CFT, and as Lenny hinted about in his intro, um, the answer possibly has something to do with computational complexity. Um, and what, the, the question I want to address in, 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 in 20 minutes is um, to what extent can the um, dynamics or the uh, dynamics of black hole be represented by a random unitary matrix? Um, and in particular, uh, uh, so I'm interested in the idea of if I have some operator W of T, so I'm evolving some simple operator W um, with an Antonian. So when can I make some sort of substitution for what I'll call W tilde, um, where I have evolution with some random unitary U, where U is sampled from some distribution P of U. And um, what are the properties of this distribution? How does this distribution depend on perhaps the details of the Hamiltonian, or perhaps the amount of time that you're evolving for? And I should add, this sort of thing that I probably people have been thinking about this sort of substitution for a long time. This has a lot to do with when systems thermalize or when, when, when they, when they re reach some sort of equilibrium. In, in particular, with respect to black holes, I think Don Page and then Caden and Presco um, talked about this in, in terms of developing the idea that black holes are scramblers. Um, so okay. This is different than asking about the thermal um, that, That's right. Well, um, that's right. I want to consider, well, we'll talk about what properties this distribution might have. It might, it might involve um, averaging over Hamiltonians, but, but um, well, I'll tell you some facts and then we can, we can talk. Um, what do you want for a W tilde? I, I want to understand when I'm allowed to make the substitution. And the substitution being that? Being I'm replacing the actual dynamics of the system, yeah. which um, is chaotic or pseudo-random with actually a random unitary and where that reproduces, um, say, the value of, of certain classes of observables. See, but the particular peak. Um, yeah, so I'm interested in is there any relationship at all between the distribution that you might consider and the particular T. Um, Can this say more about which types of observables you want to do? Yes. What is the input and output of this? When you say the black hole dynamics is like what you throw in versus what comes out when it's all evaporated, or yeah, so the well, about black hole is still there. Um, I'm in general. Well, I'm going to ask this question without talking about black holes at all, oh, except okay. until the very end, um, and then Benny will talk about black holes. But so I'm going to be mm -hmm. focusing on finite-dimensional Hilbert spaces okay. and so forth. Um, and the sort of observables that I have in mind are correlation functions, where we have you know some types of A, B, C, D, where maybe some of them have have these tildes and some of them don't. And I'll be interested, for instance, in how many how many of these operators were correlating, and then how that has any sort of dependence on on these sorts of questions. Uh, okay. So in order to do this, um, I need to introduce. Um, a notion of what it means to be a random unitary matrix um, and, and what degrees of randomness there are. And probably a lot of people here will be familiar with this. Um, 
uh, or the, a lot of the computer science oriented people will be, and perhaps the physicists less so. Um, so I'm going to first talk about the notion of unitary design. Um, and so we'll start with the idea of what it means to be a uniformly random unitary matrix. Um, so the hard measure is the unique probability distribution of the unitary group that's both left and right invariant. I think you only need to say one of those and then um, in order to have the uniqueness property, but it's also it's left and right invariant. Um, so what that means is, so it's a probability, it's a probability distribution, or it's a measure, um, and it is what left and right invariance means. Are those integral signs? Yes, well, probably wait. That, that's an integral sign. Um, that's a one. Any other questions? Um, so, um, and I, so if I act, so I have some function, if I act on the left or the right, it's the same. Um, and this is sort of, um, intuitively what you'd expect, you know, if, if it's uniform on the unitary group, then if I do a rotation, it shouldn't affect anything about the, the average that I'm computing. Um, and so, so this is, this is what it means to be uniformly random, um, and Scott mentioned this before, so I, hopefully you're all pretty familiar with this. Um, so now we can imagine that we have a different ensemble, um, which I'll put right as curly E, so where I have, um, some probabilities and some some unitary. So this is a subset of the of the of the hard random distribution, um, and then some 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 finite collection of unitary matrices, and they have some weights um, such that sum over these probabilities is equal to one, and, and they're unitaries. And so if I have um, If I have some function um, f of u, u dagger, which contains um, a polynomial in most degree k in, in u, and in most degree k in u dagger, and I have that the following expectation. choices of f that have that have that property, then I would say then one says that, that this ensemble forms a k design. So what that means is uh, I guess I can label this with some sort of subscript k to emphasize that. So what that means basically is that um, this, this ensemble is, is replicating k moments of, of the of the hard ensemble. Um, and by the way, I define this distribution, a k plus 1 design is automatically a k design. If you replicate four moments, then, then you also replicate three moments. And um, just for completeness to say that. OK, so that's just introducing um, some formalism. And since this is a complexity conference, um, let's address the question immediately, how complex is a k design? Yeah, so um, that's, that's, a, that's a great question, and uh, it was, um, so we're, we're, we're interested in the complexity of, of, um, of actually creating the entire ensemble. So we're going to consider, uh, I'll address this in maybe three, three or four more minutes, but we're going to, if we have a finite collection of, of gates and then we uh, probabilistically apply gates with some probability, we're, we're interested in what is the gate complexity of creating the, the entire ensemble. Excuse okay. me. This works for time time dependent Hamiltonian and time independent Hamiltonian? Um, right now there's no Hamiltonians at all in the discussion. Just um, unitaries. Just unitaries. And just a subset of just some, some collection of, of unitaries. Um, so I'm going to introduce um, a quantity which is called the, the frame potential. And um, so it depends on the ensemble, and it has an index k, and it's given by a double average 
over the ensemble. It's called the frame of what? Potential. So, it looks like this. This is the trace of u times v dagger, the absolute value of that, to the 2k, and u and v are, are double averages over this ensemble. And I've chosen um, each, everything to be in the ensemble with the uniform weights. Um, so this, this, is just, this is just a definition, this is some quantity, and um, it's, it's, it's uh, a nice proof, um, which I won't do here, that um, frame potential is minimized for K designs. Um, and, and otherwise, it's, it's minimized if and only if the ensemble uh, for the K design. Um, and for, for later reference, the hard value of, of, or the K design value of the frame potential is K factorial. Um, and if we have a trivial ensemble, say just of one element, um, like, like the identity, um, that's the maximum value, and that, that takes the value of D to the 2 K, where the dimension of the Hilbert space, the unitary group, um, or where D is, sorry, where D is the dimension of the Hilbert space that, that we're considering. Um, and so the first claim here um, is that, that K is related to the complexity of the ensemble. So, sorry, question. Yeah. About your location, what is, what is this FR and F identity? Yeah, so this, this, this quantity um, is defined for a particular ensemble. So what do you mean by the absolute, the, or the uh, script E is actually good identity? What do you mean by that? Yes, yeah, so you can imagine an ensemble with just one element. Oh, just, uh, so, so what are the curly brackets there, the trace of what? Of, of, of U and, and uh, V dagger. So it's double average. So for instance, if there's one element, right, this, this will automatically give you I. The curly brackets means it's an average over oh, um, This is just how I'm writing trace. Oh, just, yeah, so just trace of the person. So this absolute value would be curly E, that's just the number of elements and the number of the Yeah, that's the cardinality, sorry, that's that's right. So so I can think of these as with uniform um, weight. Okay. So um, the first so um, the claim is that K is related to the complexity of forming the ensemble. Um, that that well uh, intuitively, that makes that makes sense because if you're replicating more and more moments, it should be it should require more and more gates. Um, but we can um, we can give a nice proof of that. Um, so as I as I said before, the computational complexity on, in the sense that I'm using it is the number of gates to probabilistically create the entire ensemble. Um, and so if we imagine that we have an elementary gate set G with um, some cardinality, little g, and at each step we pick two qubits randomly and apply a gate from g, then after, um, after c steps, we would get a certain number of circuits, which would go like gn squared to the power c. Um, so at each step we make, um, we pick two <coughs> qubits, so that's like n squared choices, and then there's g different gates, so it's gn squared choices per step, and we're going for c steps. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to present a simple uh, counting argument now for, for the claim that I was making before. So if we're trying to get our ensemble um, curly E exactly, then we require, we need to generate at least that many circuits. Right, so the complexity of our ensemble, or so, right, so the, the number of, of such gates that we need C is related to the size of the, or the cardinality of the ensemble in this way. Um, which gives you a simple lower bound on complexity. Um, which is pretty intuitive. Um, so the idea is that the, uh, the, the complexity of generating an ensemble is related in this way to the, to the size of the ensemble. Um, and we can just think of these denominators as the number of choices that you make per step. Um, and so, um, and so, now let's combine that with. Actually, I can do this over here. So, 
this, this sum is, is strictly positive, so I can take the diagonal element of it, so I can, I can take a subset or bound this value of this frame potential um, by setting u equal to v. which gives me the following expression. Or, so, sorry, it gives me, gives me this following expression, which means that I can um, bound the cardinality of the ensemble with the frame potential by simple rearrangement. Um, so if I substitute that into here, then I get uh, another complexity lower bound that depends on the frame potential, f sub f uh, sub e to the uh, with index k, in the following way. Um, and as I said, for k-designs, um, this goes like k-factorial, which, which tells us that basically the complexity grows linearly um, the complexity grows roughly linearly with, with k. And sorry, n is, n is just a number of qubits or the log of the, of the dimension of the Hilbert space. Um, so, yeah. yeah. So to get this inequality, you threw away all the off-diagonal stuff. That's right. Do you have a sense of whether this is likely to be, like it's possible to saturate this inequality complexity-wise? Um, yeah, so, well, that's, sure. Um, I think in general, this bound is not going to be very tight, actually, um, because, it, it's not encoding, um, this will tie into things that I think Adam will talk about later, but it's not, it's not encoding anything um, about the, the uh, unitary group metric that, that somehow is related to complexity. It's not encoding anything about the fact that non-k-local directions are, are, are difficult. So there, there, there's, there's a sense in which we, can, we, we hope we might be able to improve on this. Um, I need to turn this over to Ben in a couple of minutes, so I just want to make a couple of points about how this is related to Hamiltonian evolution and, and observables, um, or how, how we think that is. So, this is Catherine should I think that n is much bigger than k? Um, I believe that's correct. You should think that n is, is big first and then, and then expand for k. Um, no. Uh, K can be as large as, as two to the n um, in general. Um, I forget to expand that expression. No, I, I think K, K can be as I mean K can be as large as two to the n. Um, but I, I wouldn't, in terms of trusting an expression like this, I, it's, it's, it's for it's for small k. Um, so the final point um, is that. Uh, Lenny and, um, and Adam and, and Ying and, and Scott talk about um, have drawn pictures like this, that the growth of complexity with time um, is roughly linear for an exponential amount of time, and then maybe there's some sort of recurrence after a doubly exponential amount of time. And um, so that's just that um, there's some notion of, of, of a, a, uh, a long period of growth, um, and... Sorry, what is the S here, and what is, what is S that's for? Sorry, I'm switching, um, let me, let me move this D. So, the dimension of the Hilbert space. And, um, 
And so, so the point being here is that there's some sort of, um, when we have, and this is for systems, again, where now I have a time, so where, where the unitary is some sort of time evolution. And so the idea is that in some sense, T, if the complexity is growing linearly with T, and we have, um, we have a notion of a k-design in which the complexity is also growing linearly, then perhaps we should think about the evolution, uh, the time evolution for, for the sorts of Hamiltonians that we find, the sorts of chaotic Hamiltonians that we find in, in black hole physics um, um, as, as creating pseudo, uh, as being able to be simulated with by pseudo k-designs um, in, in a time increasing with t. Um, and I think now I'm, I'm actually out of time, and I should turn over to Benny to, uh, to tell you about some other uh, new results.